I'd now like to introduce um, the CEO of the National Rural Health Alliance, Susie Teagan. Um, and Susie will be working um, and presenting today on healthcare excellence as a catalyst for regional prosperity. And it's fabulous to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to put in context uh, the... Uh, sorry, this... Which one is it? There's a spark, so it must be that one. Oh, I'm not sure. How do you... Where's the forward? Is this backwards? I know. No, maybe it's that way. Oh, here we go. <laughs> it's the big green one. The big green... <laughs> Not the spark. Um, I'm a Luddite. Um, National Rural Health Alliance is a, um, a membership-based organisation which, which represents entities that either uh, research from the day that they find a problem in a community all the way to the end of either commercialisation or policy development or funding proposals. Um, we also... Um, look after those um, universities and training organisations that train the clinicians that work in rural, remote and regional Australia, and also those entities that deliver care in rural, remote and regional Australia. And they go along the whole value chain of the patient, the clinician and the researcher. The things that we do are in the areas that are really important because the, unless we have evidence and unless we have grassroots input, we're not able to influence either policy, funding or activities at the grassroots. The, uh, the amount of um, people that we look after through our members are 7 million, so 30% of the population. And we look at workforce innovative models of multidisciplinary care. We also um, look after those people that are developing policies from either the grassroots or on an industry-wide um, perspective. So it could be nursing, it could be um, medicines and the PBS. And we also have the Australian Journal of Rural Health. It's the only journal that only looks after rural, remote and regional health. And it's a way of distributing the information um, that we uh, find from our research and also from our grassroots feedback. I've lived and worked in rural, remote and regional Australia for more than 30 years. And I have to say, in all those years, I think we've got to a, a situation where we're actually the worst off ever. I can see it in the clinicians, I can see it in the services that we provide, and I can see it in the population. 60% of our population, is, um, of the Aboriginal population, live in rural, remote and regional Australia, and the closing the gap is not even close to meeting the targets. And we don't have a national rural health plan, so we can't even measure rural health, apart from having little bits of information about how our health is getting worse. The thing about it is that 30% of the population brings in one of the most um, impressive amounts of Australia's income. So two thirds of Australia's exports are from rural, regional and remote. 90% of the food that everyone eats in Australia is from rural, regional and remote. And despite the fact that we are only 30% of the population, we bring in 50% of the tourism income. And yet, our expenditure on healthcare, whether it's federal or state, is well and truly below what the average person in the city receives. I've been on several Medicare review and reform committees and I can see where the expenditure on Medicare is, the PBS. And I can tell you it's not here, despite the fact that the population is not doing as well.
In 2023, we funded an independent report on the expenditure in rural, remote and regional health. The Alliance has been on the record since 2011 about the health funding deficit experienced by rural Australia. At the moment, per annum, there's a $6.55 billion underspend, and this is federal government funding only. That means about $848 per person less money. And you know, considering, let's say we're conservative and we have 300,000 people in this region, that you would have another 144 million per annum if you were to cash that in. If you were only considering 100,000 people and being even more conservative, it would be about 85 million. This data includes MBS, um, NDIS money, Medicare, Pharmacy um, Benefits Scheme, PBS, the Flying Doctor Service, because don't forget, the Flying Doctors is 50% funded by communities that have paid their taxes, they've paid their Medicare levy, they've contributed to the economy, and they're having to raise the funds. Could you imagine somebody in Wallara or in Turak doing that? Oh, we don't have enough money for our services, so we're going to go and raise some mon money so we can access basic services. At some stage, this has to stop. The reason why we have a triple, possibly a quadruple disadvantage, is that we have the social determinants of health, we have poor service availability, we have higher costs of access and delivery, and then, of course, we have more disasters and recoveries. And then we are told that we're going to be supported to be more resilient. We have a social contract to ensure that all Australians have equitable funds and equitable access to health services. When there are research studies done on uh, Australian Disaster Re Resilient Index, Victoria and then New South Wales have the highest proportion of high resilience. Regional Australia Institute, an organisation we work very closely with, commissioned a market research to find out exactly how regional Australia was viewed by those living in our major metropolitan cities. They found that life in the region was top of mind for thousands of city dwellers. Over two thirds of those considering moving here were ready to do so within a year. However, the concerns they had were about health, education and support with childcare. The top three factors driving people to leave the city were avoiding roads and traffic congestion, reducing general stress and anxiety and re reducing the cost of living. Of course, they also were very happy about um, the opportunities that were being provided um, for their children to have a better life. The Regional Australia Institute, with its members, including us, um, is an industry group that works across the Australian economy and society. It includes health, housing, employment, training, infrastructure, and we look at innovation, productivity, disaster resilience and transport. We have 20 targets addressing the fundamental aspects of regional living to ensure that people are able to live here well. On the way here, I was working, walking with two industry um, nurses that move around every six to 12 months from one community to another. And one of them was telling me that they were so well looked after, they're not going to go back to permanent work because not only was their pay really good, they were also given one day a week off to do some study. Why is it that we can't look after the people that are already on the ground? When HR 101 
and also Sales 101 tells you that if you look after people in the first place, they will stay and will continue to come here and co work with you. But if you don't, it actually costs you much more money to continue to have that revolving door. A key to regional prosperity is that prosperous rural communities are characterised by some very clear principles. And this is a study that's been done globally. It's the cultural aspect. So if you have a community of us and them, it's not going to work. The political components where politics are politics but you're still able to work in a bipartisan manner. Social life and the fabric that pulls everyone together. And where people have an entrepreneurial opportunity. Regional Victoria and New South Wales has had the largest increase in shop owners and in business owners in the last three years and it has allowed for people to be entrepreneurial and to move away from the city. If you look at towns like Dunedin in New Zealand, about 10 years ago they had a competition, it may have even been longer than that, they had a competition to say which town around New Zealand should have the fastest internet. And Dunedin won. It has the fastest internet in Asia Pacific. And since then, it has brought so many startups and businesses, it has increased the capacity of the university and industry. We need to have one system where people work together. The average person doesn't care if you're state, federal or local. They don't care if you're a, an independent practitioner. They just want the system to work. Those people that work for the government or have received government funding, you're employed by the people. And in the end, you have a social contract to the community to do the best you can. We need to have a focus on population health, not on last year's budget. We need to have a focus on preventative health. There's plenty of talk about preventative health but not much action. We have enough pilots. We have more pilots than Qantas. We're sick of it. We're sick of being the guinea pig of governments and other funders that no longer wish to put trust in those communities that already bring in billions of dollars. How much more do we need to give? In the end, these populations deserve more. They deserve more in education, they deserve more in health, and the discrepancy and inequity between city and rural has to stop. Because what's happening now is that planning is going on historical funding, it's not going on an equitable distribution of funds. Thank you. I'm